Okay, so our next talk is by Jeremy Gray from the Open University in Warwick. And he will speak on Poincaré et la compréhension des mathématiques. In French, maybe. <laughs> non, alas. Euh, il me semble que c'est méga de faire une conférence en français, mais vous avez écouté. Je, je suis désolé à cause de mes mauvais français. Et donc, on parle en anglais et peut-être on discute et poser des questions en français. So this is, of course, Poincaré at two stages in his life. And uh, what I want to present is a uh, analysis of how he tried to understand mathematics and to help other people to understand mathematics, which is not the same exactly as simply to do mathematics. And he held these views. He followed his own advice in a number of areas in geometry, in his philosophy, Um, his conventionalism, his theory of knowledge, his work in physics, in electricity and optics, which was the cutting edge of physical science in his day, in number theory, function theory, and elsewhere. And I think that it's possible to see a uniform approach develop throughout his life. Understanding in mathematics for Poincaré was not the same thing as to be rigorous in mathematics. Um, from the quotations you will see in French, um, he does have a high opinion of rigor. It is essential, um, but it is not perhaps the most important thing about presenting mathematics. So this is to, from his address at the International Congress of Mathematicians uh, in 1908. It's L'Avenir des Mathématiques. Um, So he did care about rigor. I give two pictures from his early work. Um, the context is indeed the invention of Fuchsian groups. And he has a correspondence with Fuchs in which he corrects the older man's mathematics in respect of analytic continuation. That's the picture of the annulus you see. Um, where has it gone? Up there. And where he has a much better grasp of the importance of the domain of the function under consideration. You see in the other picture the origin of a triangulation of the Poincaré disk. Uh, but he was aware that rigor was um, not always the whole story, shall we say. Um, what proofs can become too large to be properly understood and new terminology in his day He gave the example of uniform convergence, um, enabled you to simplify proofs to isolate a bit and to say, we deal with that in this way. And now we have a little uh, block, if you like, a piece that we can carry around and, and put into a longer argument without losing the thread. So again, these, these points come from L'Avenir des Mathematiques. Um, I should say not all of them from the edition in the essays of Poincaré. This particular paper suffered rather terribly when it was anthologized. Uh, proofs can be wrong in kind. Um, in the example of potential theory, um, you don't get, in his day, an intuitive proof based on the naive physics. Um, you do get proofs. Poincaré is famous for giving the uh, méthode de balayage. But you don't, in that way, copy the physicist's intuition The mechanism of the phenomena is not apparent. Um, rigorous arguments depend on, on convergence questions, which are too slow to be used in any numerically approximative way. Um, here from a much earlier paper. Um, and uh, then I give you uh, this, this remark of his. Um, in any case, you know, a rigorous proof is the proof of the possibility of something. Um, uh, it always teaches us something. And um, who has the right to say that a solution that is good enough for physics is not good enough um, for mathematics? You can't distinguish by any clear means between the arguments of one kind and the arguments of another. And indeed, physics is a heavily mathematized subject. So it's not really clear what the physicist's intuition is without some component of mathematics. Um, and then we get something else. This is from his 
uh, response to Hilbert's formulation of geometry, which is a very, uh, shall we say, axiomatized um, approach that uh, treats of different systems of geometry and provides consistency for them, usually in terms of arithmetical models, we would say. Um, and this strikes him as inadequate from a philosophical point of view. So he has no objection to the mathematics. Perfect. But he feels that in geometry, we acquire knowledge of the external world. It's how we are able to find our way to this institute. Hilbert's geometries have no component of human understanding. Right? They are mathematical objects. They do not connect to the way the, uh, the infant human learns about the external world. Okay, so this is quite a philosophical rather than a mathematical objection. Um, and then he says, look, supposing at the end of a long piece of work, um, you proved something. Well, really, you should put yourself eventually in a situation where you can predict, or should have been able to predict, the broad features of um, the problem that um, you're trying to grasp. And this is a wonderful quote at the end I like. I like very much. Um, uh, in English, the soul of the fact. So you imagine some algorithmic process producing one line of a proof after another. And uh, will this produce the kind of understanding which enables you or your audience to do something new? Or is it just a sequence of statements um, correct in their, their logical order? Um, one of his uh, echoes, one of his similar figures, is Ernst Mach. And when Poincaré gave this talk, he was impressed with Ernst Mach's idea of the economy of thought, which would allow you um, to, well, to proceed, to act in the world, to do things. Um, individual facts, little mathematical observations, had very little interest uh, for him. But if you could produce a satisfactory analogy, and Professor Yokoz already used the word analogy in an earlier talk, um, you might be in the, in the presence of some kind of law in physics or some kind of theorem in mathematics. Um, so this kind of aesthetic response, i let you read the quotation, but this aesthetic response is very important for Poincaré, not, let me say before I let you read on, uh, not aesthetic in the sense of how beautiful it is, but in the sense of how efficacious it is, how enabling it is for you to do something yourself. So we have the idea that this uh, economy of thought is productive. And I just want to say uh, one thing about this from the psychological point. Poincaré gives this famous address to the um, Société de Psychologie uh, here in Paris in 1909. And at one point he says, look, I'm not talking about just the subjective feeling. That can be wrong. And he says even in his own case, as he wakes up in the morning, he thinks, oh yes, I understand it. And you start to write the proof and it evaporates. So this sense, this aesthetic sense, is not that sense of, oh yes, I understand it, which I'm sure every mathematician has found to be unreliable, at least at times. Uh, it comes with that, but that alone is it can be deceitful. Uh, he's really talking about an activity of the mind, and this activity of the mind uh, is the activity that creates knowledge. And in his day, he had no doubt about the validity of uh, arithmetic. This is one of the important um, motors, he believes, in the human mind. is the capacity to reason by recurrence and therefore to uh, have arguments about the natural numbers. Uh, and he believes this is built in to the human mind. At this time, so 1904 and thereafter, um, Zermelo uh, 
prompted by Hilbert, is um, trying to produce an axiomatic set theory. Um, and Poincaré famously is unpersuaded by this uh, uh, approach. Um, Zemelo at one point imagines that you have what he calls a definite uh, idea of what are the elements of a set. This is the, the, the slightly dubious point in his first presentation of these ideas. Uh, Poincaré holds the opposite view that um, definiteness has to be very much connected to what is called predicativity. You have to know and be able to identify the elements of each set. And uh, Zemelo, he felt, had been rather uh, casual about this. And in particular, he allows sets that are really uh, too large for the human mind to confront. So I think this has been a, um, a nightmare for Poincaré. Um, I'm sorry it's only a finite number of sheep. So he feel, Poincaré feels that these sets are too large to be understood. Uh, by the human mind. And if you cannot understand uh, this, then you really shouldn't talk about it, even if you've got some formalism that appears to let you do this. So I'm not saying I, we necessarily all agree with this. I'm presenting you Poincaré. Um, OK, so how should you do mathematics in the opinion of Poincaré? Um, certainly, you should be rigorous. Axiomatic set theory does not strike him, indeed, as sufficiently um, philosophically sound, but there are things you can do. Analogy and generalization. And I want to give one example. If, uh, if this mathematics is unfamiliar to some, please forgive me. And if there are experts who will object to my oversimplification in the next few slides, please forgive me again. Um, so I'm going to present an analogy that Poincaré pursues with a view to showing you two things. One, why he does it. And secondly, just to indicate that analogies are not so easy. Poincaré is not saying, oh, look, this is like that, and therefore, the, the therefore is to be established independently of the analogy. So Emit, uh, the distinguished French mathematician of the generation before, and uh, certainly an influence on Poincaré, uh, was a distinguished number theorist in particular, amongst other things. And amongst the very, very first works of Poincaré are some works on number theory, and they are also Technically, strictly his last work, the last paper he publishes, the last he puts in the post uh, to the journal, is the one before he goes into hospital and has the operation and then eventually dies. Uh, and that is also on number theory. So this is a long-term interest of Poincaré's, um, not so usually remembered today, um, which has to do with uh, finding those Fuchsian functions. So, so these are functions that have some uh, periodicity property um, that can be employed to do number theory as well. Not all of them will. And what it, Poincaré is after is an analogy with the, the modular equation. This is a famous equation uh, from originally from elliptic function theory, and it connects, um, in the way he formulated it, um, a certain group mentioned here, SL2Z, and then some transformation that does not belong to the group, and you can find some relations between a certain function invariant under the group and another value of that function. They're connected by some polynomial equation called the modular equation. So this is a modular equation. Just remember, we have a polynomial equation uh, connecting a function which is associated with a group and is invariant under the action of that group and some uh, other value of that function obtained in some other way. So he wants to generalize this. So he says, OK, we need two groups, and they need to have something in common, a large subgroup of finite index. And then if you do that in the case of the modular equation, you succeed. So let's try for Fuchsian groups. Well, you can associate your uh, ternary form, your 3 by 3 matrix, with a 2 by 2 matrix of complex entries. So this puts you in the Fuchsian world. And now you have to ask, well, what were your coefficients? Were they real numbers? Were they rational numbers? Were they integers? And you'll get, in this way, three groups for your ternary form, three groups of two by two matrices. And using these, you can ask the same game as you did with the modular equation. And all this slide actually says is that if you play that game, you get two commensurable groups. And 
you get an algebraic connection between the functions that come with one and their values on some other, in some other group. I'm, please forgive me for being a little vague. The point is that this generalization can be made to work. You can get, in the setting of Fuchsian groups, a class of Fuchsian groups which give you the same kind of mathematical story that you had for the modular equation. Okay. The point here is that Emit would have always advocated, and did advocate when Poincaré was young, to him directly, that you should study this example in detail. Emit's view was that if you have a really interesting function, group, whatever, you should study it in detail. It will reveal a hidden richness if you study it with care and attention. Poincaré's view is quite different. He wants to know why that equation is there. Not, I accept that it is there, I wish to study it in detail, but I want to know why it is there. And if I understand why it is there, I may find similar things to study. But in any case, I will have a, a new understanding of it because I know the story to which it belongs. Okay? And I think perhaps you could see some of, of, of John Morgan's story as people looking for the story to which the Poincaré conjecture belongs. How do we organize our thoughts so as to uh, deal with a problem? So this is Poincaré's view here, that um, you would look for a story about commensurable groups which would explain to you why there was a modular equation. Uh, I don't want to say much about this, so I'm sure there are, there are other talks coming up, but another famous use of analogy by Poincaré is in celestial mechanics. You take a very simple dynamical system um, uh, where some parameter is zero. You vary the parameter away from zero, so you now get a family of uh, differential equations, one for each value of the parameter, and you ask if some important property of the situation where the parameter is zero extends to small non-zero values of the parameter. Okay, so this is another example of his work by analogy. Uh, here's a slightly more um, uncertain one. Um, there's a talk, I think, on Friday in which we discuss how much of, of uh, astronomy uh, survives from Poincaré's time. In Poincaré's time, they simply did not know what the stars are. And they thought they were perhaps solid bodies that had cooled down from a gaseous and a liquid state. Okay, so that's certainly not the modern view, really. Um, so Poincaré was interested in, in what shape do they acquire as they set solid. They've been a rotating fluid, and now they're going to set solid. That's one of his questions. But in any case, what can you say about a rotating body of fluid? And he looked again for an analogy. Right? Um, if you have um, a rotating fluid and you perturb it a little, it will settle back into a new equilibrium state. And uh, this is his um, expression of faith to uh, Lyapunov, the, the, the Russian mathematician. The, the debate here is between Poincaré as a physicist, if you like, and Lyapunov, as Jean has demonstrated on several occasions, Jean Mohan demonstrated on several occasions, um, uh, between Poincaré as a physicist almost and Lyapunov as someone who wishes to have the mathematical proof of the uh, the beliefs that Poincaré thinks can be made to come about. Okay, the very first International Congress of Mathematicians uh, took place in Zurich. Um, Poincaré went, and he gave this opinion about the relation between mathematics and physics. So we should be making precise the notions of number, of space, and of time. And here I wish to underline one really important point for the second half of the talk. Elle lui fournissant la seule langage qu'il puisse parler. Physicists can only speak one language, and that is the language of mathematics. Okay. Um, so this is this is is crucial for for what we uh, want to do. It's a dialogue in both directions, because if mathematics has given physicists their language, physics will give to mathematics um, all of the things that take it beyond the discrete world. Poincaré believed that the only natural object of, for the mathematician was the integer. Okay? 
and physicists will bring to it, for example, the concept of the continuum. And I should say here, Poincaré is aware of non-standard continua, right? So this is not a statement that the continuum exists, but physicists found it first. It's a statement that there are many ways of, of forming continuum, many ways of, of going beyond the rational numbers, but the physicists use a particular one which has been very, very helpful for us as mathematicians. I should say a little about electricity and optics at this stage. I, I didn't prepare a, a, a transparency here. Um, the situation for most of Poincaré's life in electricity and optics was one of constant theoretical change. So at one stage, when he writes electricity a optique, there are two predominant theories, that of Hertz and that of Lorentz. The Hertzian theory uh, cannot deal with Fizeau's work on the speed of light in water, and Lorentz's theory has cannot establish, and in fact, uh, disagrees with Newton's third law, the equality of uh, action and reaction. The, the problem is with the ether. The ether can do things to bodies, but bodies can't do things to the ether. The, the, that's the weakness in Lorentz's theory. So Poincaré is aware that there are two major theories of electricity and optics. Uh, they cannot be put together. Each one has a distinct quality of merit, and each one has a flaw, has a failing. Um, and I think if you do wonder about what physicists are saying, the crucial question to ask them is what about when theories are changing? What about when you, the physicist, are changing your mind about what we want to say? Right? It's not so interesting to ask them when everybody's happy and contented that dinosaurs roamed the earth and matter is made of atoms. It's better to ask them when they're going, well, you know, we might want to think a little harder about that problem. So this is Poincaré's view that the theories may well be wrong. Um, in fact, clearly in his day, the Dystian optic theories were wrong. Um, but you do have to deal with experiments that the experimentalists will tell you are OK. And you have to accept the mathematical theorems that the mathematicians will say approved. So what happens? Well, the theories somehow survive. What you, are, you thought you were talking about, the object, Maybe not. Maybe they had the wrong story about the objects. But the, the theoretical expressions in the form of equations, um, that will survive. I mean, down at the end, um, uh, I find this quite striking. Um, you know, how ridiculous were Coulomb's fluids? Well, you know, they're back. We call them electrons now. Um, it's quite a nice. Uh, indication of the way in which, um, in Poincaré's view, people amplify the experimental results and the mathematical theorems with talk about objects. And this talk is not anchored in either domain, and it can be replaced with talk about other kinds of objects. Of course we talk about the objects. Physicists naturally prefer objects to mathematical theorems. But this talk, says Poincaré, is perhaps a little, it floats a little freely above the substantial discourse. And this is what he means by conventions. The, there's a geometrical conventionalism which gives you knowledge of the external world. And then there are these things we believe about physics, the various laws, conservation of energy, um, things like that which have been elevated, if you like, to the status of axioms, that we take them as conventions. If you do an experiment and you get a very unusual result, you don't say, oh, maybe the inverse square law of gravity is wrong. You look for an explanation of your novel result somewhere else. At that moment in physics, the inverse square law of gravity has become something that you do not contest. You could, but it requires extreme circumstances uh, for you to do that. I want to move here. This is an amalgam of, of David Levine's cartoon of Wittgenstein um, and Poincaré to make some remarks about understanding in general uh, of a quasi-Wittgensteinian kind, because I think that Poincaré was saying some of the things that uh, come up later. So skepticism as a view uh, is hostile to the talk of meanings. It's hostile to the idea that we know what something means. And Kripke gives this very comic example you know, you haven't added up all the infinite sums you could do, 
So maybe it could be that after a time addition is just wrong. And if you move that over to some axiomatic setting, you can make similar kinds of objections. It kind of looks rather fanciful, and I think, I don't know, a considerable number of philosophers would like to prove somehow that skepticism was wrong. And the skeptics say, well, we don't need to, because actually it's quite a harmless view. Um, but instead of assuming that you know quite so much about what things mean, why don't we just agree that what we're doing is talking to each other about the world, and we want to talk in a consistent way to each other, in a way that is supported by the best evidence we can find. And if we have to revise the way we talk, well, we revise the way we talk. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't talk with certainty in the opinion of Wittgenstein. It doesn't mean that you're going, you know, you're allowed to go, oh, I don't know why you believe that every time somebody says something. Uh, you can just get on and do things. Um, this is kind of conventional view, it seems to me, from, from Wittgenstein, that uh, we elevate certain statements to a certain role in our discourse. And that role in that discourse, at least in the way Poincaré would take it, is to say that you don't argue with that. You don't argue with the inverse square law of gravity in, in this particular domain, or with um, whatever particular system of ideas have determined the mathematical form of your theory, unless you really, really have to. And of course, in any elaborate argument, especially in physics, I believe to this day, you don't have the guarantee that your physical system is actually um, consistent. I, we are exploring ideas in physics. We hope they work. We find problems. We deal with it. Okay? And this is, this is Wittgenstein's advice that, well, you know, that's the best you're going to get, right? If you're looking for consistency in these very elaborate arguments, uh, you may never get it, and it may not matter because it hasn't held us back yet. We've always been able to repair uh, any damage we encountered. Poincaré was taken to be a skeptic in his time. He was accused of this uh, by people uh, in exactly those words, and uh, this is his, uh, one of his responses. Uh, of course, we accept the testimony of experts, and we rely on our ability to communicate with each other. And without the ability to communicate, we can't say that we are being objective. So remember that uh, mathematics provides the language for physicists. Okay. So what I see here, curiously, um, I'm not, I think the, the influence on Wittgenstein here comes really from people like Hermann Weyl, but I'm more interested in Poincaré anyway. Uh, what I see here is... Um, what Wittgenstein enthusiasts call a language game. You have a set of rules for communicating. And those are the rules of the game. That's how we communicate. So we have decided that this physical phenomenon is determined by a certain Lie group. Well, you can't break that rule halfway through. Um, so what validates your arguments is that you can persuade other people of them. They can listen to you. They can criticize you. The dialogue goes backwards and forwards in a satisfactory way. Um, and that's really maybe all you can do. So famously, um, for example, in the dispute with Edouard Leroy over the rotation of the Earth, when he was um, accused of being a skeptic, um, he really relied on our discussion of Newtonian physics has been the best language for describing the different things we see, including Foucault's pendulum. Um, it gives the most elegant, effective explanations of things, and that's all you can say. Um, and, of course, and this is a, the well-known picture of, of a non-Euclidean space on, on, on the screen, um, he was firmly of the view that if Creatures turned up from another part of the universe who believe that the universe was indeed non-Euclidean, and we believe that it is Euclidean, there will be no fact of the matter. They will not be necessarily wrong. We will not be necessarily wrong. Our arguments will be that these work best for us, and they would say our way of thinking works best for us. In Poincaré's case, because our knowledge of the external world is hardwired into us through evolution and through our growing up as, as infants. You learn the external world before you can be taught anything. It has to be innate, our ability to appreciate the world. But he was not a skeptic about mathematics. Okay, so 
I mentioned skepticism as a broad view. Poincaré was not a skeptic about mathematics. The ability to reason by recurrence is built into us. And so already we can do certain things that the skeptic would deny, in Poincaré's opinion. Um, and also recall, Poincaré took the view that mathematics and physics are um, inseparable. So we're going to come back and discuss that. When people talk about proof, I just want to make a couple of remarks about this. Um, we have, since Poincaré's time, a wonderful and uh, delicate apparatus of mathematical logic for dealing with uh, what things depend or do not depend on what other things. Right? This is uh, an elaborate and rigorous branch of uh, mathematics. And Poincaré would never have disputed that, I think. He might have worried about the foundations a la Zermelo, but he would not have disputed the quality of the arguments. But he would have said, look, there's more to it than that. There is more to it than just saying, oh, this argument is rigorous and this is not. And this you see in, in, in many mathematicians writing today, um, that a very long argument um, is not uh, the same as an argument that you immediately understand. A rigorous argument, certainly much better than an unrigorous argument, uh, is not all you want. If you wish to be a creative mathematician yourself, you need more than the results of rigorous arguments. And in the modern jargon, but some of it's 19th century, you think of mathematics as a practice, as something that people do. As they acquire understanding of things, they are enabled to do new things. It's because they understand this piece of mathematics that they can prove this new result, okay? Um, it's an activity. You practice it in the way that you almost practice a musical instrument. And then there are interesting things. Some people say that this concept is the fr a fruitful concept, or it is the right way to think about things. This is the natural proof of something. Hilbert, for example, uh, would from time to time uh, insist that there were unified methods for tackling certain problems and one should not stray beyond the bounds of, of the kind of core idea and bring in techniques that lay uh, in another domain of mathematics. And this is not a doctrine. I mean, the first calling to a mathematician is to solve the problem. Um, but it can be the case that some mathematicians say but can we solve that problem in a different way, a more appropriate way, a way that is more uh, consonant with what we believed before or might be more productive in future? Um, Poincaré's view, then, is that what you want is the overview, the ability to see um, how the details fit in and how they can be uh, then um, used. So this is, this is something that he insisted on. Um, a lot, and of course uh, he emphasized very much um, the role of intuition in all of this, and, and that includes of course the psychological feeling that you're on to something. So uh, I'm moving now to my, my concluding remarks. Um, we have a tension, if you like, creative tension is the cliche, between uh, the rigorous side of mathematics and the enabling side of mathematics um, that Poincaré has tried to put across. And I think actually in a, um, in a novel, to a, to a novel extent, that not every mathematician at least goes into print saying, look, we need to find the right way to think about these problems, okay? So I, I thought I would just summarize a few of the things that I found with Poincaré um, that, uh, connect with the, um, the, the lame du fait. Um, he very much emphasized the role of groups. Transformation groups, whenever he could find them, he put at the heart of any problem he had. So for example, in number theory, um, with the example of the generalization of the modular group. Um, he had a, an enthusiasm for taking a problem with a particular, let's say a particular differential equation, and varying the parameters, especially if you can start from a very simple case, which you understand very well, and then let the parameter move away from zero. Can you capture the 
essence of the simple problem in the more complicated uh, situation. Um, the example from fluid mechanics um, and the de debate with Lyapunov um, goes like this in a way. His belief is that we understand the finite dimensional vector space situation very well, essentially completely. Uh, so how much of that would survive if you had an infinite dimensional vector space of things to study? Um, uh, in fact, some of these topics have come up already, as I, as I, as I hope when I saw the program. Um, uh, if you have a three-dimensional problem, is there a two-dimensional one inside it? Uh, Professor Yokoz gave us a, a, a problem on the two-dimensional torus, which uh, in some sense reduces to a very interesting question on the one-dimensional meridian of a torus. Um, Oh, Professor Morgan's talk, again, we, we were invited to consider three-dimensional manifolds being constructed out of two-dimensional manifolds. So these are the kind of, of things that he advocated. The next three slides are just to show that um, I don't consider analogy uh, and I, as trivial, and I don't think Frank Ray considered for one minute um, uh, the analogy is trivial. Um, we frequently perform infinite sums of the kind on the first line. The elliptic functions are double sums over a group, if you like, z plus z. When Poincaré starts studying Fuchsian functions, he does a similar kind of thing, but he sums over the elements of a group. So he looks at the first line of the equation, the first equation at the first line of that screen, and he says, oh yes, it's not so much summing from minus infinity to plus infinity as summing over the elements of the group Z, the integers. So let's do this in my novel case here with a different group. And now he has problems because the convergence theorems are much harder to understand. They can be non-trivial series converging to the zero function. But nonetheless, there has been a sort of analogy. And then you have to deal with the novel difficulties uh, that um, arise. So my, my penultimate slide, because the last one is just a picture and a familiar one. Um, a proof for mathematics in mathematics for Poincaré is something that enables you to do something else. Right? I once saw a definition of a proof in a logic text that there was the definition of a theorem was it was the last line of a proof. And that may be very nice for logicians. But I don't think it's what Poincaré would have accepted, or most working mathematicians, a good theorem, I think, is something that enables you to do something new. You can take that theorem somewhere else. Um, that's uh, Poincaré's idea. You may well approach this by some act of analogy from what you've already had before. It has a specific virtue. It shows you why some things are the case. And that's why is, is, is something that mathematicians talk about. Poincaré is perhaps unusual in dealing with it directly. I think a lot of the way Poincaré writes, or wrote, I should say, um, is trying to encourage you to think in a certain way. He is not only interested in the results. He's interested in getting you to think about a domain of problems uh, in a particular way. I thought very clear in the previous talk that Poincaré has to set up a way of thinking about problems involving three-dimensional manifolds, and he has to do a significant piece of work, or you will remain persuaded that somebody should do it, but not persuaded that he did. So of course he delivers that. So he's trying to get you to, to, to organize your thoughts in, in a way that is productive for you. Um, in physics, he's completely aware that the subject is subject to change. Physical ideas are coming and going. They're in conflict with each other. It's true today as it was then. And he asks you to think not about the physical objects, but the experimental results, the mathematical theory that supports them, and to be a little reluctant to commit yourself uh, to, to objects. For him, a good proof, and this is my last remark, is a new and valid use of the terms that it involves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Questions or comments? 
Yes. And so I'm trying to puzzle out from your remarks and examples, um, maybe something a little, little more precise. And it seems to me that what you're suggesting is that when Poincaré talks about analogy, he has in mind something like a pattern or a generalizable relation, right? He's looking for some kind of relation, pattern, property that can be generalized from one case to another. And that's, um, that's how he uses analogy. What struck me as very odd is that he seems to draw from the quotation you gave this idea out of Marx's notion of economy. Um, but as you probably know, there's a wonderful critique of Marx's notion by Einstein, who remarked that for Marx, um, a scientific uh, science is a uh, catalog and not a theory, which is to say precisely that for Marx, the generalizable relations are simply not there. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't really argue about the last one. It's a curious fact that Poincaré and Marx were put together in their period. So when Marx's works are translated into French, a number of them are left out on the grounds that Poincaré has said somewhat similar things anyway, so we needn't translate these <laughs> German papers. Um, it's not just a pattern or a generalization. I think that it is, it is a little bit uh, wishy-washy, but I think that Poincaré, and I don't, he's, I think he's unusual in doing this. I think he's unusual in saying it out loud and in print. Poincaré believes you have, if you like, stories you tell yourself as a mathematician or a physicist about how you think about this problem, how you pose the crucial questions, why you tackle them in this kind of way, why it worked in a simpler case, what it seems to be the problem here. And that's what he is looking for. And then he can test that in particular way. So if he thinks that what is really happening here is that there's some group doing something, then he gets really quite excited. But I don't think he would have said for a minute that there's a precise definition of analogy. Uh, we just have to get quite good at finding it, and then we can do wonderful work. And that's why I gave these examples at the end. You can have every hope for an analogy, and it obstinately refuses to help you. Um, so it, it, it's just the emphasis on what it is to understand something as opposed to know something that I think is, is specific to Poincaré. I don't find other people in the period, or very many mathematicians, in print saying this. If you come from a math department, you hear it a lot, of course. But, and I imagine you did back then. But that's the, 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 the essence of, of, of the thing as I see it, that Poincaré carries around a set of explanations of things that are known to work and wonders why if you understand why it works, maybe you can produce the right generalization. But I really repeat that. Okay. Question? Yep. Experimental physicist and theoretical physicist. About experimental physicist, it is quite well known that the best experimental physicists used only quadratic equations <laughs> in their work. So. Do I understand correctly that you were mostly talking about theoretical physics in this talk? Well, I think that's true. I think, I mean, there are famous and rather comic interventions of Poincaré in the domain of theoretical physics, of experimental physics, excuse me. Um, I think that... It is indeed theoretical physics that he considered he was talking about. But he is insistent that this physics be tested in the laboratory. And I think, at least in the case of um, heat diffusion and anything connected with uh, the Dirichlet problem, 
there are explicit objections from, you know, explicit comments from Maxwell and Helmholtz that this mathematics is somehow misplaced because we know how the physics works. Now, you might, of course, say they are also theoretical physicists. I think that's unfair to both of them. I think they manage to be theoretical and experimental. Um, so yes, in a certain sense, you're right, but Poincaré is not, in the end, does not put his trust in theoretical physicists. They are part of the community. When there was a dispute about Maxwell's laws, um, it was an experimental matter. Poincaré contributed to the testing of a particular, in fact, incorrect, as it turned out, refutation of one of Maxwell's predictions. So, yes, you're right in this. You're right, except that Poincaré would have extended the dialogue to include the experimental physicist. More questions? So, uh, as you know, uh, computer scientists proved, published recently a uh, uh, proof certificate of Tom, uh, five Thomson theory. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think Poincaré would have thought of that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I do have a, 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 a friend and colleague who's responsible for one of the computer-assisted proofs of the... No, it's not a computer-assisted proof. It's a, it's, a, it's a computer... It's a proof certificate that the proof is correct. Yes, okay. So, I, I agree. Um, so, when I've thought about this in discussions, my understanding is that he, Poincaré would have said that that is a piece of, that establishes the rigor of something. But even if they did this for a new theorem, let us imagine that not a, not a proof certificate of an existing result, but they independently had a new result and a proof certificate for it in their language, which I think my answer is Poincaré would accept that, but he would want to know if the statement fitted of the new theorem fitted to a story he can tell and he would want to know if we could prove it in a way which was well i keep saying enabling but mm -hmm. exactly what he would want and you know that you might find within a, a part of a proof a productive new idea anyway so just the ratification that the statement is, is proved uh, would mean, yes, he would use it in his own work. Probably he would want to find a proof that he could use in other ways, in other settings. Yeah, it reminds me, a long time ago, there was this proof by uh, Lanford, which was a computer-assisted proof, and Sullivan said once, I want a brain-assisted proof. Yes. <laughs> well, Sullivan, <laughs> as so often, speaks for Poincaré, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, another question? So thank you very much.